it, but I'm not going to do it. I'm not going to execute. Mm-hmm. Is that a sin or not a sin? two parts, three parts. We had the four parts of the liturgy, right? Remind me, anybody? The preparatory, thank you. Operatory, liturgy of the word, liturgy of the faith. So preparatory, each one has its own theme. Preparatory is where we prepare. Operatory is where we offer liturgy of the word when we listen, and then liturgy of the faith is when we pray. You see, there's two major actions that we actually prepare for, the reading and the prayer. And these are the major actions that should involve everybody in the Christian disciple. Should not stop reading, should not stop praying. <coughs> That's a side of it. When we go to the operatory, what is the theme? What are we going to I'm going to ask three questions always, and this is easy. I think we need to summarize the, the, the third grade curriculum for those questions. I have to go back and rewrite them. What do we celebrate or what we remember? What we offer and what we receive. That should be the, I think it's easier when we know what the end of the day is. What do we remember in the operatory of the In the practice, right? Okay. And there are two major items in the baptism that we actually first, and that the people of the church uh, are excited about them. There's two relations the relation of the The Lamb of God and the 
first church, there was no many feasts. There, for, for example, the first church had no Christmas, but they celebrated those two feasts. The Theophany, they call it Theophany, means the revelation. Theophany, Pania means uh, revelation, exposure. <coughs> With Theo means God. So the revelation of God is one feast, which is the baptism, and the baptism. And the second feast was the resurrection. Those are the two feasts that the church celebrated. That's why it is not a surprise to see in the liturgy, you have a stop for the Theophany, and you have a stop for the resurrection. And these are the two uh, big celebrations in the liturgy. liturgy. So in the offertory, we have the commemoration of the baptism. In it, we celebrate the, the Theophany and the Lamb of God. How do we celebrate the Theophany? We have songs. The priest blessed the Urbana and the bread in the name of the Trinity. And every time he points to a hole in the bread, there is three holes on the right. He puts them on the right, two holes on the left. And the first hole, he says, blessed be God the Father. And he says, blessed be God the Son, the bottom one. And then he says, blessed be the Holy Spirit. Why the Father and the top, the Son on the bottom, and the Holy Spirit in the middle? Because that's how the image of baptism is. The Father voice in the heaven, the Son is on, on earth in the Jordan, and the Holy Spirit is in the middle. He's acting out the scene of baptism. There's also the baptism of the Lamb. He, he covers the Lamb with water. And then we go into the other revelation, the Lamb of God. In that offertory, the priest puts all the requests that he wants, especially the confessions, as a sign of the church that I am and acting out of the, the fact that I will lay all our sins on the Lamb, the Lamb of God that carries the sin of the world. So this is the, the, op the operatory. What happens in the, um, let's open, I think it, what we celebrate, what do we remember? Why is it locked? I did something wrong with this. Something. It's locked. This one? No, no. I did something with the. Yeah, good. What, the, the, what is it? What we celebrate, or what we remember? Celebrate and remember is one thing. We're actually. In rejoicing or remembering an act, an act that Jesus had done that's so profound, that's very essential to our salvation. So that's what we call celebrate or remember. What do we offer? What I'm coming to give on this remembrance? With this remembrance, what am I offering? And what do I receive? Sometimes you have something to offer, sometimes you only have something to receive. Like in the liturgy of the word, we receive a lot. We receive a lot of instructions and teaching. When I offer, I offer Alleluia. Uh, the Ptasi Kyrie. A little bit. Like a, a response in between. Other times when I'm praying, I'm offering a lot. I'm receiving a little bit, but waiting for something big. So uh, this is, these are the three questions, and, and what we're going to try to. Here is the four parts. The four parts, preparatory, operatory, liturgy of the word, liturgy of the faithful. And the first one, the preparatory, has also four parts. The clergy dressing, altar dressing, prayer of the hours. And why do the, 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 the priests and deacons put on white? That's a question we're going to have to answer in the anaphora. He's dressing the altar. You notice that the church traditionally acts out what the church believes. It, the church lives fully the mystery of salvation, fully in the liturgy. Whatever we believe, we act it out. And that ends the operatory, uh, the uh, preparatory. The operatory is four parts, fiction of the lamb, baptism, burial, service of church. The most important of them is the baptism. He selects the lamb, choose the bread in a cross fashion like Jacob. He examined the urbana, the bread, and we notice that the Urban is made like a house or a building. We said this from St. Paul. Now, therefore, you are no more strangers, foreigners, but fellow citizens with the saints and of the household of God and are built like a house. 
upon the foundation of the apostles. Apostles themselves are foundation, but Jesus is the corner stone. And that's how the Urban is, is, is like one. Yeah, we always put those three holes on the on the right side. The five holes in general represents the five piercing wounds of Christ, the mark of the body. Like, how do you know Christ? How did he show himself to the apostles and they recognized him when he showed them the pierced hands and feet and the side? So there are five wounds that marks his body, <coughs> even after the resurrection. <coughs> As a priest, I always make sure that these three on the right, <coughs> two, there is a most probably in the shroud, that's I think where this happened. On the shroud, when the church looked at the shroud, the three, the wound of the side was on the, on the right hand side, on the left side of Christ. <coughs> because when he, when he sleep on the shroud, Exactly. You, you have a lot. The shroud has actually contributed a lot to the tradition. And then you have 12 crosses for the disciples. You have the Agios of the Os around. Agios of the Os, Agios of Shiros, Agios of Sanatos. And then the rest of the Urbana doing exactly what St. Paul said. Jesus in the cornerstone. The apostles are foundation. And then we are around them. And this is the song of the city, of the building. The, the, the character of the, the, the Christian. That's the Spadikon, the 12 crosses. And then after that, uh, in the operatory, we remember that, how we remembering the baptism as a major theme. And then the hand of John on, on the head of Christ, the Father in heaven is calling. The Father in heaven, where the heaven is open. And the Holy Spirit descends and the Son in the Jordan. So when Abuna is going to do what we call the commemoration prayer, he takes water, baptizes the lamb, we call it the lamb, and he puts his hand on the lamb, and then he goes and say all the names of people that ask for prayer. Especially, I'm thinking, especially this is what I do personally, is the people who have confessed. Because my, the confession, I don't take it with me home, nor, nor I put it in my pocket. It goes on the head of the lamb. So we act out what we believe. Uh, then uh, we pour... He poured down his life and we poured down. First of all, we bury the lamb, means that he carries our sin. Now that's the, our sin. This corporal will go with us. We need it today in the anaphora. This corporal is that what represents our sin, as Jesus is covered with it. And with it, he carries the way to cleanse the sin, the cross. So when he st stands at the door of the altar, he's saying, he's answering a question. So you told us, the church told us, that this lamb, that's the best of us, represents Christ, the lamb of God. Why is he wrapped in our sin? And why is he carrying a cross? And the answer is, he's doing this, glory and honor to the Holy Trinity. This is a piece from Saint Gregory, the theologian, talk about the, the, uh, the uh, cross. Why did you think Jesus did this? He didn't do it, and sometimes that's one. I think this is what I was talking about this morning with uh, with the, uh, the servants of sixth grade, said some people, uh, that was actually a Protestant preacher one time said, and I was very excited with him. He's the first one to come out and say it. Josh McDowell. He said, uh, you always hear Jesus died for us, died for us. He died because he loved us. He died for us. Yes, but that's not the first reason. That's not the more, most important reason. Why did he die? He died because his father's will. He wanted to please his father first. He said, let it be your will, not mine. And let this cup pass from me. But let it be your will. You can do anything and everything. So he died first, glory and honor to his father, to please his father. And then he can say for us, because the father and son loves us. But that's the main thing. Glory and honor to the Holy Trinity. <clears throat> and then we go the blessing, the father, the son. Now this is the son. And then the Holy Spirit. We go to the wine. We pour the wine, remember that he poured his life for us, and we bury. On top of it, we put the same corporal that represented our sin. 
this corporal would go with us, uh, journey. And that ends the operatory. The energy of the word, we listen. And then in listening, we're, there's prayers. What is the theme, again? What are we, the, our main request in the liturgy of the word? <coughs> Mainly the priest and the deacon. Which, is, which we call the symbolically uh, eyes to see, ears to hear. You keep hearing this all the time. Jesus in the parable of sower and seed, when they asked him, why do you speak in parables? He said to the disciples, to them were not given the mystery, but to you the mystery is opened. Uh, and then he said, many prophets and righteous persons have desired to see the things that you see and have not seen. This is Matthew 13. So we ask during the readings, the church asks for eyes to see, ears to hear. <coughs> that is the main request of the church. But as we read, we enter, interrupt the readings with glory to God, alleluia, words that so uh, celebrating, it's very joyful words. Uh, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. And we said, Alleluia means, in, in short, go crazy for God. They said that one of the, one of the uh, translations of Alleluia, Hallelu, Ja, uh, Hallelu, Hallel means uh, to be excited, to be out of oneself, to be like a fool. So literally, it is to go crazy for God. That's what it is. And the other one is the Ksasi is Greek from give glory. Glory to you, O Lord. And then also the, the priest, as he goes around the altar, when you see the priest doing this, with the deacon, he is saying in, in, in silent, in his, in his uh, heart, and, and with his mouth very quietly, Lord, now you let your servant depart in peace, for my eyes have seen your servant. Again, eyes that see. <clears throat> That's the whole theme of this liturgy of the word. <clears throat> And that we pray especially for the catechumens, by the way. The liturgy of the word, I know Megan is you know, very uh, excited about this, that we get people in the church and give them the liturgy of the word. And the whole prayer of the liturgy of the word, that the eyes, their eyes might be open. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, that is, and then the play, Alleluia, praise God. And then if it's Marot and Jeveet, Nihon Ibran and Shrois, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Glory be to you, O Lord. And after that, the sermon. And then the priest would ask forgiveness <coughs> and pray the liturgies. And that ends the prayer of the liturgy of the word. The liturgy of the faithful, I have a key, key verse. Remember the key verse. The, the key verse actually summarizes the, the prayer of the, the liturgy of the faithful altogether. It starts by justification, by faith. And I always want to ask people, I'm going to ask them this Sunday, because uh, Shahira reminded me that people should know. What do you believe? Exactly. Thank you. That's, that's what should be very clear. It should be very clear in our mind. The church makes it a point that in every prayer, it is not. Yeah. We will be very clear. Verily, I say. Yeah. It is like Amin. Truly. Yeah. Amin. Yes. <coughs> the creed is the beginning. What, what is after the creed is peace. What is after the, the faith? Once we have the faith, we have peace. And then after the, the peace, we have access to grace. Those are the three steps in the liturgy of the faithful. The first one, the justified by faith, is, is in the creed. And, and St. Paul actually says it. You have to believe in your heart and, and also does not just heart. It has to be لَأَنَّ الْقَلْبِ يُؤْمِنْ بِهِ لِلْخَلَاسِ وَالْفَمْ يَعْتَرِفْ بِهِ لِلْبِرْ It has to be both heart and mouth action. That's why the creed has to be said loudly. We have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. You would notice that the consolation prayer is about peace. By whom we also have access by faith into the grace where we stand. There is a grace. There is not much more than just peace. And there is grace that has joy in it, rejoice, and hope. Whenever you hear the word of hope, always think of heaven. So there is, um, that is Roman again, the access is faith, believe and confess, as in baptism, for we with the heart man believes unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. 
Abuna washes his hands, the time to examine oneself and also examine ourselves as we enter into the prayer of the faithful. And as he sprinkled water, he uh, is, is actually giving everybody a sign to examine oneself. Am I ready? Uh, how we should be ready? I ask, uh, we should do this, that you prepare yourself for this step, for this, for this, for this uh, stops in the liturgy. When we offer, what are we offering, we said in the liturgy, in the operatory? It's ourselves, everything. My body, my soul, my mind, my emotions, everything. So that means my body's ready. My soul is ready. So some, some people say, why do we have to fast? That makes your body not ready. Why? If, you, if, you, if I tell you, it happens. Sometimes we have very few people coming for communion. And they maybe ate late. So I have a lot of body, a lot of bread. And I see on the face of the person coming, just like, I don't want to eat anymore. How would that make you feel? This is not any food. You have, we have to be. So to prepare my body, it's almost like I'm inviting you for dinner and say, you know what, I've done all what I can. I killed myself. I, op I killed, I, I sacrificed my firstborn. And I'm putting him on the table. And then you come and say, but I really just ate at McDonald's. What? <laughs> that attitude of resistance in itself is unreadiness. So that's why we have to be ready by the body. On the heart and the soul and the mind, I have to be unoccupied and to be reconciled and to be ready to give to God myself totally. No. Yes. Yes. When somebody is sick, when somebody is sick and or have diabetes, they cannot fast for more than four hours. I think their sickness itself is a fasting. But that's not not understanding. Then then we don't understand what we're doing. Yeah, we don't understand that we have to do everything with understanding. Saint, Saint Anthony said this. Sure. It's to prepare. It's it's demanded as a law. Or exactly. No. No. It just. What would it feel like when I go to the communion? I don't want to have another bite. It's not readiness. I'm not ready. I think I am, but I'm not. I, then it becomes a routine. Then I'm going to take it as something that okay, you know, just let me have it and be blessed and go. That doesn't mean. Right, right. I, I. <coughs> it is. It is okay. Here is here is the other extreme. Make it. If you just let it be, there is going to be because most people. I'm just going to have to say this as a confession. Most people are children-like in their mind. If you, if you just let them say, if you say, okay, that's okay, you can do whatever, you know. That, that is going to be taken to the, extra, the other extreme. It's okay if he comes and says to Abuna, I really don't have a problem with that. Say, Abuna. Why do you have to say, I'm just, I don't have a big thing to say with that? But that's what confession is for. If he comes and takes absolution, that's fine. Yeah. But that's a level of maturity. And then, exactly, it should be on case by case basis because some people are very immature, some people are very mature. You're, I'm worried. I'm worried about the other extreme that people would take it very. Exactly. Uh, I want them to. I think that's not right. it, it is the extremes. Either to put all the guilt on the priest and have them decide for them and have yeah, no conscience, yeah, yeah, yeah. or to have all the power in the world to say this is right and this is wrong and, and I will do what I please. 
There, there, are two, there are two extremes, and we have to be careful. It should be case by case. Some people, I'd say to them, like if somebody comes to me and say, I have a migraine, and I like to take uh, a cup of coffee in the morning. If that person really cannot do that, there are, there are. I tell them, okay, let's work on this. Take a coffee and come to take communion. It's medicine. But then, but then I tell them we have to work out of this. You became so dependent on coffee in the morning. I'm not gonna deprive you from communion because you have a migraine. Mm -hmm. Yes, but that, that's something that I can say to everybody. No, Maybe that's it. Maybe, <laughs> yes, exactly. Or the substance dependent. Okay, the liturgy of the faithful has seven parts and we're gonna take, we took one this today, we're gonna take two uh, other, two and three, and then the rest of them will take the next time. The prayer of the conciliation, anaphora, prayer of the institution, litanies, commemoration, fraction, confession. The anaphora is the word that actually said about the whole liturgy of the faithful. It's called anaphora. This is what we're gonna to do today is anaphora proper, the anaphora, the, the prayer of the anaphora itself. Starts by reconciliation, we said the Abuna takes the same corporal that covers the altar that represented our sin and makes it as a partition because on the eastern side of the altar there is the icon of Christ. So it says like I can't see you because of my sins. We can see you as a people because of our sins that kept us away from you. We are repentant, we are ready, we are doing everything but it is not us. It has to be you that takes that veil out. So at the end of it, at the end of the prayer of reconciliation, which is a request for peace, uh, uh, this is the, the, the peace from St. Paul, for he himself is our peace. There is nothing else. There is nothing I can do to bring peace into my life. Who has made both one, has broken down the middle wall of separation, and having abolished in his flesh the enmity that is the law of com commandments, contained in ordinances as to create to himself one new man, thus making peace. What do we celebrate? What do we remember? The question. It is this, the resurrection. In the reconciliation prayer, we celebrate the resurrection. What do we offer? What should we do in the prayer of reconciliation? We pray for peace. I pray for my peace. Sat with myself and say, you know, I'm, 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 I'm having some issues that actually have, I have no peace with you, God. I cannot come. You, we notice ourselves sometimes. I cannot talk to God. My prayer becomes so difficult and arid, and almost I'm talking to a wall. That means there is walls between me and that's what this prayer is about. So I pray for myself, and I ask that for this wall to come down. I pray for people in my life that we have no peace together. We can't see eye to eye, they say. There is also another invisible wall between me and people. I pray for people who have walls with other people in their lives. So I bring a list, starting with myself, starting with people that I know in my family, people I know in my circumstances at work, anybody that I need to bring peace to their life, this will be the time to pray. The reconciliation prayer is a request of peace. At the end of it, what do we do? We kiss each other. Yes. It is the healing part, exactly, to bring us to peace because I cannot go to heaven without that. There is no way I can go to heaven without that. To forgive, to let go, exactly. So that ends with the kiss of peace, okay? And we said the theme is, the theme is uh, the resurrection because we lift up the veil, right? It is the, the triple, the triple uh, revelation. Uh, the triple, the triple uh, event or something. So let me just give you, tell you what it is. There is the lifting up of the veil. I see the bread and wine now. That is Christ coming to me in the upper room where the doors are closed. Remember how in the beginning of the faithful used to be the doors, the doors. Did everybody go and close the doors? Why? We're going to start the the upper room, the revelation of God. He's coming back to us in his risen body, and we're going to touch him. We're going to see him. And then I need to be happy and to be excited about that. And as the deacon says, greet one another. The, I can tell you the images, the disciples are actually kissing and hugging each other in the upper room when they see Christ. Wow, this is true. It is true, it's real, that God had forgiven us.
They hug each other? Yes, that's what he told them. Yes, they told, he told because that's why they called the apostolic. They called the apostolic kiss. They must, the apostles had done it. And then they had done it because they took that, that incident in the upper room and they prom promoted it. They said, Jesus told us, and when I see you, your heart will rejoice, and your joy nobody will take away from you. So they did it, and they moved with it to everywhere they went. It becomes, it becomes a tradition. It is in everywhere, Catholic, Orthodox, everywhere. Yes. I can't, I can't imagine how they, they received the risen Christ in the upper room, and they just stood still. That, that, that can no of course not they hugged each other they hugged him they were like all over the place exactly <laughs> true yes and they would celebrate, they celebrate the resurrection that's it and St. John Chrysostom sermon it's a beautiful sermon and they sing it in the Byzantine church they say let us forgive one another and let us hug one another by the resurrection. By then, then we put the gospel, the, the reading book, behind the throne to have the teacher, Christ the teacher, hide as we behold Christ the sacrifice. Uh, then immediately, look at this. The, the, and Afora starts with this verse, and I want to put this verse ahead of the game. So I'm, I'm going to go with, the, with you through the movements of the anaphora. And then we we'll go and read the handout. So the Anaphora starts with this verse, and I think you, you might have it there too. Even when we were dead and trespasses, made us alive together with Christ, by grace you are saved, and raised us up together, and made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Starts by being dead. Then a resurrection happens, but doesn't stop there. There is also lifting up to heaven. So there's two, three, three places, dead, risen, and, and lifted, or presented, raised us up, okay? So these are the three actions. And Afora actually is the third one. So we have already celebrated the resurrection. Now we move into the lifting. And Afora is actually offering back up, lifting up. Abuna starts by actually saying, and stating the obvious, the Lord is with you and also with your spirit. And he says, lift up your hearts. That's the, that is the, the action that happens in Anaphora. And we lift up our hearts, we say it is with the Lord. Where is the Lord? He's, on, he's sitting on a throne in heaven. And, and the third one, let's give thanks to the Lord. So you're not going empty, you're going, you're going with thanksgiving again. You're carrying thanksgiving. At this point, there is no repentance. We're done. We're going to go back to repentance at the end. But at this point, it is mainly the thanksgiving that continues with us. There is a rabbi, rabbi said, at the end of times, there will be no sin offering, there is no trespass offering, there will be only one offering, which is peace offering, the thanksgiving offering. The, it is the, the third of the offering, or the fourth. There is the peace offering, the only one that would continue. So in this part of the anaphora, we don't ask, uh, you, you even don't see, Lord have mercy, you only see, uh, let us give thanks to the Lord, worthy and just, holy, holy, all these uh, uh, heavenly things. There is no Lord to have mercy in heaven. I mean, yes. Abuna here goes and takes, in the middle of it, before he says, holy, holy, when you sing, the cherubim worship you and the seraphim glorify you. Look at what he's doing. Where did he put the corporate that represents our sin, that, that partition? Where did he put it? They say he casted it out on the left side the side of um, the side of like uh, 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 that is like uh, negligence like he's not paying attention to it the right side is the side of uh, hello here it is, you see it? this is where it is he put it there, that, that seal that was on the top that was the partition then he goes, it's now on his left hand. <clears throat> it's on left hand. Here, this is it. He took this one where he blessed with from the bread. He took it from to the top of the bread. He's blessing people with his, the body of Christ, as happened in the resurrection. 
<coughs> the blood stays on there. Then what happens then? This is the corporal that is the left side corporal. There's a journey for this one, very subtle journey. There, now he goes and he exchanges the places. He puts the left side on the right and the right on the left. So where is the corporal that represented our sin? It's here. And then he goes another time and he puts it on top. So where does it end? On the chalice, on the blood of Christ. The place of all the things that we have done goes on the blood. But he takes the blood down to do what? To sanctify us. He says, holy agios three times, pointing out that the blood of Christ takes our sins and the blood of Christ is what sanctifies us. So he makes the exchange. He takes our sin, we take his holiness. And why is he doing it in this complicated way? Because he always around the altar have to go anti-clockwise. He cannot just, he, why he didn't go like, okay, this is the blood, this is our sin. No, because it's going to go clockwise. Because in the altar, because it's heaven, it is against time. We're going against the clock, against the watch, against the sundial. We don't go with time. No, yani, we're outside time. This doesn't happen. Yes, it doesn't happen with time. It's not under the rules of humanity. This is something that happens that's heavenly, that is actually outside time. So that's why he has to do it this way. This is a side note. That's just for you to know. And every time I go around the altar, I go this way. It's, it's always going this way. We can't go this way. We don't do that. And Mr. Hassel said to say, every something, everything we do in an action, we have to make a statement. It's like we have to say something. Like we face the East. Why? I tell you, when people face the East, because they are waiting for Christ. We're making a statement. Uh, is, is God tied up to uh, directions? He's not. But we are making a statement. When I see somebody standing by the door, I say, what are you waiting for? It's cold. Why are you not inside? Most probably he is that impression I have. He's waiting for somebody. Why are you standing at the door? Most probably he's waiting for somebody. Keep looking at the door. Keep looking at outside. Then I have an impression that he is, even if I don't ask. And it is important that people ask, why do you look to the east? So I answer, because Christ is coming again. Coming again. Exactly. That, that, why do you have to look for the east? There is, what, are you looking at the building? No. Are you looking at uh, Kaaba? Jerusalem? No. I'm looking to the east because I'm making a statement that Christ is coming back. That is the statement. Because they said traditionally, first in the, there is a, a, a verse in, in uh, the Septuagint in the, in the Psalms that uh, Hallelu, yeah, Hallelu, God, that are ascended to the east. There was a verse about ascension. And they said in the Mountain of Olives, when the disciples looked, it was toward the east. That he was ascending to the east. And then the, side, the, the angel said that, the, that Jesus that you saw ascended would become the same way. There is always this Ezekiel. That the prince would come through the door that faces the east. So you use it as a pointer, but not Exactly. So this is a point. It's almost like you're drawing a map. Or the right hand of the Father. What does that mean? And that's always the, the writing of the verses in the Bible, that he sits on the right hand of God the Father. What does that mean? God the Father has right hand, left hand. Yes. It's exactly, that's what it is. So there is a statement made. Why do, why do Jesus always, when he prayed, look to heaven? That God only found in the sky? It's... It is a, a place of consecration. It was the temple that Daniel had to open. It was facing west. Yes. They was making. A, they were making a statement. A statement against the sun, because they're coming from Egypt, where the worship of sun is the main deity. So they have to give their back. Actually, in the Feast of Tabernacles, they used to go in the morning and the sun is rising, give back to the sun, and they say, as they come from the, the Brook Kedron, and they say, our fathers worship the sun, but 
we, their sons, worship the only true God. And they turn and they give their back to the sun. And they make a procession. It's all statements of faith. Like why Jesus would look to the heavens, the sky. Because nobody usually looks at the sky. We always look at the earth. We look at each other. We look at our work. What is the place of consecration that people have no, no way, no power over to change? Nothing. It's the only place that's kept for God. That, that we, we, we can build stuff in it. Yes. Yeah. From the east of the, from sunrise to sunset. Yes. That's another one. Yes. Exactly. Because, yes. But not the sun as the, the child. The sun, it's all the sun as you Right. In Hebrew, it is different. It is not the same pronunciation. Okay, so this is all statements about faith. I'm making statements about faith. I, I live. Why do we, why do we bury people with their feet toward the east? Yes, Coptics from beyond time. All the tombs. Exactly, the feet. Because when they rise, they have to be expecting Christ. It's all statements that look, we, we know. Yes, exactly. It's all the statements about what we believe. That we, we turn our life as a testimony to the promises of God. No. Most of the churches, actually the Catholics have that tradition too, from the Roman church. Yeah, they they were very religious. They knew exactly. The, so they put also their faith into practice, into life practice, to make their life a testimony, uh, uh, a practice of their faith. That is the point. That we don't do anything that is not. We try to make the Bible live in our lives. Okay. And then at the, at the end of the anaphora, so he makes that exchange, and then he puts incense when he says about he was incarnate, that the incarnation of Christ brought the aroma of Christ to the world. There's a shame Paul speak about it. And from that, at one point, I take on my hands and point to the bread and the wine. Why? At one point in the liturgy, I think that's what it is. He took bread unto his holy, spotless, undefiled hand, which are blessed and life-giving. But I look at my hands and I say, they are neither holy, nor spotless, nor undefiled, nor, un nor uh, blessed. What am I supposed to do? So I make a point in the liturgy to say, it is now not my hands. I give them, Christ will borrow them. They become the hands of Christ. Because the, the church uh, states that the priest acts in persona Christi. And then, like he's acting on behalf of Christ. If he says... What Christ said to the church, and that gives me the understanding of theology of priesthood, says to the community of the believers, give me a person to represent me. So the, 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 the believers would say, take this person. So from that time on, whenever that person in the church, in the liturgy, he's acting on persona, he's the steward, he's the representative. So if my hands are not my hands. So nobody, no priest should say, oh, the, the liturgy says my hands are purified and blessed and beautiful. No, that's so. <laughs> so this is where I actually do it again. Cleanse my hands and put on the, the aroma of Christ. All right, so let, let us go through the handout and then. Mm -hmm. Yes, yes, absolutely. And then also because of the, we do it at the cherubim hem. Uh, some look at it as the, the cherubim who are with their wings moving around the throne. Uh, they say that too. But, uh, and then we go into the institution. In the institution, the priest does exactly what Christ did. He took, he blessed, he gave thanks, he broke, and he gave. And he uh, the mixed, and he gave thanks, and he blessed. And every time we say amen. And then, he, then we do the, what we call the anamnesis, as we commemorate. Anamnesis is, anamnesis we said? Yes. Am, amnesia is forgetful. Anamnesis means 
not, not to forget the prevention of loss of memory. Because Jesus said, whenever you do this, to remember me. Yes, and St. Paul says, whenever you uh, eat of the bread and drink of the cup, you remember the Lord until he comes. So that is called the commemoration, the anamnesis. They called one another. It was echoey. Can we go into the... Yes, that's how they did it. They did holy, and then the other one said holy, and the voice was so powerful and moving. Too, too powerful. Can we have the, the handout? Yes. They have the, they, they have sikhons, like four. They're always double, couples. Right. I want to go through the handout now and just let you help me out with this. In the last 15, 20 minutes, we can go and cover this. What I will do, I will read with you some parts and ask you to answer the question. Uh, in the anaphora, we start with this key verse. But God, who is rich in mercy because of his great love with which he loved us, even... It's a five, not an S. Even when we were dead in trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved and raised us up together and made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. So we move from the tomb and the resurrection to the upper room and the reconciliation, and then now we go to heaven. I want you to come up with similarities between this and the uh, how do we offer. Let's read the part that I think fits very perfectly into the Anaphora. It's Revelation 4. After these things I looked, and behold, a door standing open in heaven. And the first voice which I heard was like a trumpet speaking with me. What is the door? Right, what did the... Let me just go... Yes, but what is... The, the part of the liturgy that we go with you. You do this verse and then you understand where I'm going with this. Maria. Be nice. Here we go. I mean, Blanche is a teacher of third grade. She knows that stuff. Let me go with you. Here. You know this verse? I go here. So what is the door? Actually, we get access to... You notice that, for, what is in chapter 3? Chapter 2 and 3 in Revelation, anybody remember? Just to kind of have an idea, it, it's very difficult. The messages to the churches, what is that in the liturgy? It is the letters, it is the readings, the memoirs, the gospels, and the letters. Physically, I'm talking about the station in the liturgy itself. Yes, but be before we left the Prosperine, we had also said the creed. We accessed this by faith, that we stated our faith. So that part of the liturgy is where you have the creed and the reconciliation prayer, is that door that we enter through to heaven. What I'm trying to say is th that part of the book of Revelation is actually what the church is doing. Three, two and three is the messages. And say to the church of Laodicea, there is voice and there's words and there's recommendation, there's instructions, advices, 
Then we move into a heavenly vision. There's a heavenly vision after that. So there is, uh, let's read, so the door, then come up here and I will show you things much, which must take place after this. Do you see anywhere? Come up. Come up. What does that say? Where is it? Where do you, where you, where you find it? Hello? So where does it come up? Any idea? Come up. Right. Let's let's go read it and then and then read it together. So it's easier to do this. Come up here, and I will show you things which must take place after this. Immediately I was in the spirit, and behold, the throne set in heaven, and one sat on the throne, and he who sat there was like a jasper and sardius stone in appearance. There was a rainbow around the throne in appearance like an emerald. Around the throne were 24 thrones, and on the thrones I saw 24 elders sitting, clothed in white robes, and they had crowns of gold on their heads. And from the throne proceeded lightnings, thunderings, and voices. Seven lamps of fire were burning before the throne, in which are the seven spirits of God before the throne. There was a sea of glass like crystal, and in the midst of the throne, around the throne, were four living creatures full of eyes in front and in the back. The first living creature was like a lion, the second was like a calf, and the third living creature like a fish, like a man, and the fourth living creature was like a flying eagle. The four living creatures, each having six wings, were full of eyes around and within, and they do not rest day or night, saying, Holy, Holy, Holy Lord God Almighty, who was and is and is to come. Whenever the living creatures were give glory and honor, thanks to him who sits on the throne, who lives forever and ever, the twenty-four elders fall down before him who sits on the throne and worship him who lives forever and ever and cast their crowns before the throne, saying, You are worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honor and power, for you created all things, and by your will they exist and were created. Let's go and read that part from the anaphora. Uh, the priest turns and faces the congregation in sign of the cross and made over the people with the cross and says, The Lord be with you all, and they say, and with your spirit. He crossed the deacons around him and says, lift up your hearts. Does that say anything? Yeah. Come up. There's a door open, and there's an invitation, right? And then they answer, they are with the Lord. Let's give thanks to the Lord, and he is worthy and just. Where do you find that? Yes, verse 11. Yes, verse 11. Worthy and just, worthy and just, worthy and just, O Lord, the Master, God of truth, existing for ages and reigning forever, abiding in the highest and beholding the lowly, who created heaven, earth, sea, and everything therein. God the Creator. Where do you see that? In the same part. For you created all things, and by your will they exist and were created. By your will they exist. What does that mean? That he holds all things. That God actually holds all things. So he holds us and all the creation. And it is the pantocrator word. By your will they exist and were created. Okay? Then he says, the Father of our Lord God and Savior, Jesus Christ through whom you created all things seen and unseen, who sits upon the throne of his glory and worshipped by the holy powers. What happens in chapter 5 in Revelation? I just didn't, because it's a long piece. What happens? They have a scroll in the throne that nobody can open. And then the priest, and the, the, they would ask, who is worthy to open the scroll? Nobody is. So he starts to cry. Then they introduce into the scene of the throne the lamb. You notice here in the anaphora two times that the, the, the throne scene is brought and then the, the lamb is introduced to it twice. Chapter 4, chapter 5. So he says, And the Father of our Lord God and Savior Jesus Christ, through whom you have created all things seen and unseen, who sits upon the throne of his glory and is worshipped by the holy power. You notice that he's changing now this, the tone or the, the story 
from praising God the Father as a creator and the Pantocrator to praising him for the gift of his son. Then he says, who sits upon the throne, who is Christ, sits upon the throne of his glory, he speaks to the Father. And then he continues, before whom? Now, what, what do you uh, hear? Who you seated? Stand up. Why? You seated? Stand up. Yeah. In the chapter 5, actually, too, there is thousands of angels standing in his presence. Thousands and thousands of angels standing. Right. <coughs> but, but there's that scene in heaven that there is a lot of angels standing. What else you see that is not written? That the, that the clergy is putting on white. You know what the Ethiopians do in their liturgy? What do they do? You know, you know that? They go to church with white. The whole village goes out. In Christian villages in Ethiopia, they go out in white. And they sing in white and they come back in white. The whole day on Sunday, they're just singing, praising, and they're dressed in white. Um, then before whom, so you see the stand up, then before whom stand the angels, the archangels, the principalities, the dominions, thrones, the lordships, and the powers. This is from St. Paul, but it describes that standing status in, in heaven. And then look towards the east, around you, then he moves from before whom to around you. Why? He speaks about Christ in the first one, he speaks about the Father in the second. Around you stand the cherubim full of eyes, and the six wings seraphim, praising continuously without fall, falling or failing, saying, and then the people says, the cherubim worship you, and the seraphim glorify you, proclaiming and saying. And I have said this before, why the cherubim are the one, and what they are saying? What are they saying? It's holy, holy, holy. And, and look at this, whenever the living creatures, in verse 9, whenever the living creatures give glory and honor and thanks to him who sits on the throne, who lives forever and ever, the 24 elders fall down before him who sits on the throne and worship him who lives forever and ever. Why do you, I always say, why in the book of Revelation they wait for the singing of the cherubim to fall down? We made this point before, remember? Why is it only when the cherubim says, holy, holy, holy? This is important for us. <coughs> Whenever the living creatures give glory and honor and thanks to him who sits on the throne, the 24 elders fall down before him, as if they wait for him, so they don't fall until the cherubim sing. We said this in Isaiah too. The seraphim said, holy, 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 and as they utter the words, Isaiah is shaking. And this case is much more clear. And this is important for the religion. Uh, but this, described as, I think this is clear, because it says, around the throne there are four living creatures full of eyes in front and back. The first living creature was like man, etc. And the cherubim full of eyes, right? The cherubim full of eyes. Why is that significant? It is the, the vision of the cherubim that creates the song. When you have a person who is all eyes and see God fully, how would you expect him to sing? Yeah, they're all, all vision. They are having the fullest vision. Once you have a person that has the fullest vision, their praise is very moving. It's very moving. That is what it is. That's why in the Greek, in the Byzantine, I have the, actually a very uh, a, a beautiful song. I wish, I don't know if I have it. But that's how they sing. They said, we who mystically represent the cherubim and sing the thrice holy hymn, let us cast us aside all earthly care and go to behold to behold the king of all who comes invisibly upon the angelic hosts. Like there is a vision that the, pres the person that attends the liturgy have to have an eye. But how do you have this eye? How do we sing without an eye? And how do you have the eye without first casting all the earthly care? Um, the cherubim worship you and the seraphim glorify you. That's the song of the cherubim that we share in. 
as people standing in heaven. And then uh, the priest uh, places the veil which was on that, and we did this movement already, uh, we explained that. And then he says, Agios, Agios, Agios. Holy, holy, truly are you, holy, O Lord, our God, who formed, created, and placed us in the paradise of the light. There is a specific, the first one in the Anakura is about the creation. What is this one about? Right? He says, the crea created everything by your only begotten Son. What about the second one? Holy, holy, truly are you, O holy, O Lord, O God, our God, who formed, created, and placed us in the paradise of delight. And when we broke your holy commandment through the serpent's deceit, we were deprived of eternal life and exiled from the paradise of delight. You did not entirely abandon us, but, con but uh, uh, attended to us continuously through your holy prophets. And in the last days, you appeared to us who are living in darkness and the shadow of death through your only begotten Son. Again, our Lord God and Savior Jesus Christ, who is the Holy Spirit and of the Virgin Mary. The first one is about the creation. What's the second one? The first one is about that God, we praise him because he created us and supported us. But this one, we are going to praise him and call him holy because he had saved, thank you, saved us. So the two big actions of God. The first one that we praise him for, that he had made us. What is the second one? That he saved us. See, those are the two big pieces in the anaphora. I praise him and I tell him worthy and just and thank you for creating me. And I call him holy for saving me. That is the responses. And again, it is through Christ he created me and through Christ he saved me. And then the, the deacon presented the censor and then incarnated and became man. He started talking about how did God save us. He became man and made us, uh, uh, taught us the ways of salvation. That's the key. And uh, granted us the grace of rebirth from above for water and spirit. He made us united people unto him and purified by your Holy Spirit. He loved his own people. For our salvation, he gave himself up to death that had possessed us, whereby we were bound and sold on account of our sins. He descended into Hades through the cross. He ties here the sin and the death to the salvation. Like our salvation is by forgiveness and by giving life. Sin and death. Salvation is forgiveness and life. Then you have the response, Amen, we believe. He rose from the dead on the third day, ascended to the heavens, sat down, and this is where we start the commemoration, the anamnesis. The retribution in which he will appear to judge all the world in, in, in uh, equity and, and reward each one according to his deeds. Let us be according to our mercy, Lord, and not according to our sin. That's the, that's the formula. So we remind God of all the things that he did. Exactly. You know, you tell God you're going to ask him for something. Yes. And then you go to him and you ask him. Yes. Let it be according to your mercy. Right. That's the request. But I want to say something. What do you think of this prayer of the church? How, how do you see it? I want just to go step back. Go step back and look at the, these prayers. What does the church do here? Um, that is not like my own prayer. It's not something for me. What does the church do? But don't you think it's like a bigger picture? Like the church taking a, a stand not about my like small things of day-to-day -day life this is exactly speaks to God on a royal level like we're discussing with God his creation and his salvation <laughs> that is something that I as on a personal level I would might do it but it's not really it, it seems like too big for me No, he does. He says, like, say, let me give you the language <clears throat> from the first one. It says, uh, O Lord and Master, you see the first part of the anaphora, the, the, the Eucharistic prayer. O Lord and Master, God of truth, existing before ages and reigning for abiding in the highest, who created heaven, earth, sea, and everything that is, the Father of our Lord, through whom you created all things. There is the first person language, right? You. Yeah. Or second, second person. Uh, that's where we have the confusion. I'm going to keep it saying it until we get it. it. There's three persons. He speaks to the Father about his 
That's where we need to go back and do it over and over again. He speaks to the father about his son. There are two persons. Please get it. <laughs> I'm going to die. <laughs> Please get it. <laughs> what? <laughs> yeah, you're going to die. I'm going to die. We're all going to die. It's uh, 10 minutes I have. But do you get this? He's not speaking about God the Father in the third person. Who is spoken about as the th th third person in the Ghayb? Yes. But he always addresses the Father. Because we want to thank him for that. That's the greatest gift. Yes. Why don't we do that? We say, let's go to the beginning. Let's go there. So it says, let's give thanks to the Lord, right? Let's give thanks to the Lord. Okay. And then the, the people says, it is actually not he. Correct this. This is a mistake. It is worthy and just. That's from the book of Revelation. Right? Right? What did the what did the cherubim says? You are worthy, O Lord, to receive glory, honor, and power. You're worthy to receive glory. Why? And they said the same thing. Because you created all things, and by your will they exist and were created. He does need to know that. Does God need to know that by his will things exist? But they tell him. We appreciate what you've done. It's almost like when you go to your uh, husband or wife or mother and say, Mom, I thank you very much for the food that you have done. It was the most delicious. I bet you it did take a lot of work from you. You spend a lot of time with it. Does she know, not know that? Yeah, exactly. But I mean, does she know that? Of course she does. But when I say thank you or I ask forgiveness, I say why. I say thank you. It makes much more <laughs> sense to the relationship. So that's what it is. So the, we, because you created all things and by your will exist. So he says, O Lord, Master, God of truth, existing before the ages and reigning forever, abiding in the highest. That's glory. That's giving God glory. And then we, we come to through whom you have created. Whom is now the Son. Notice something, and I, 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 this is, I say it sometimes and sometimes I regret saying it, that the priest speaks to the Father, but the congregation is always responding to Christ. Because the priest is acting in persona of Christ. I'm actually speaking with Christ to the Father. And the congregation is speaking to Christ, the Son. That's complicating. That's why I regret it. Just, just focus on the language. The priest speaks to the Father. And give him grace, praise for the creation and then for the salvation. And the one, the first one in the creation, it is the Eucharistic prayer. The, 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 the Catholics called it the Eucharistic prayer. What is the Eucharistic prayer? Because they focus on, let us give thanks. We call it anaphora because we focus on, <coughs> lift up your heart. Anaphora lifting up. That's the same prayer. It is exactly the same. There is no difference. Okay? So let's go to, back to the holy, holy, holy. And the, the, you, you <coughs> we talk about the sin in this one. Because that's where we need the salvation. O oh, truly, you are holy, O oh Lord, our God, that's the Father, who formed, created, and placed us in the paradise of delight. When we broke your holy commandment through the serpent deceit, we were deprived of eternal life and exiled from the paradise of delight. You did not entirely abandon us, but contract, contact our, or uh, maintained us continuously through your holy prophets. And in the last days, you appeared to us who are living in darkness in the shadow of death through your only begotten. It's an appreciation. That's where Thanksgiving comes off. Like, I really understand that what you have done is really very powerful and it shows a great sign of fatherhood that you have not abandoned me. And then we go on all the way to he rose from the dead. He it is when the priests speak and then um, then the institution prayer. So that's the introduction to the institution prayer. So what do we what do we remember? And we said we are in heaven. That's how we said it. So what do we remember there? Remember two things, right? The creation, that God is the creator, and also the salvation. And what do we offer? Hmm? And what do we say in this? We offer glory by saying worthy and just, and we offer praise when we say holy, holy, holy. That's the highest form of praise. And we offer faith. Where do we offer faith? Trust. Amen. I, I trust. I believe. 
the institution prayer in the last five minutes. And the peace, peace that uh, we got is from the Corinthians. For I received from the Lord that which I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus on the same night in which he was betrayed took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, Take, eat, this is my body which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same manner, he also took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant of my blood. This do as often as you drink in remembrance of me. <coughs> what do we celebrate? It's exactly this that what he had done, the gift of his body and blood. Why it is in the middle of the heavenly scene? Think about that. Why is it in the middle of the talk about glory and, and argios and worthy and just and the cherubim and the seraphim and the angels? Exactly, that's very true, but also in the heavenly scene, there was the lamb that stands as slain. He, he was presented in the heavenly scene as the sacrifice. So that really fits in the core of it, chapter 5, where he is brought as lamb stands as if it's been slain. The priest points with both hands covered with the veils to the bread and wine and begins the, soul, the, the prayer. He instituted this great mystery of godliness for us since he was determined to give himself up to death for the life of the world. And then he said he took bread upon his pure, spotless, undefiled, and blessed life-giving hands. What do we say? We believe. See how many times we say we believe in the institution? So what's the main offering in the institution? He offers himself as, as body and blood. What do we offer? We believe. Amen. We believe, we confess, and we glorify. Faith is the main offering. That this is truly as he said. Amen. Um, he looked up toward heaven to you, O God, his Father. See, again, I'm speaking to the Father. And Christ is in the third person. And then we say, Amen. He blessed, Amen. He sanctified, Amen. We believe, confess, and glorify. Again, this is all offering of faith. Uh, he broke it and gave it to his holy disciples. Peter Apostle saying, Take eat, eat of it, this is my body. This is true. Amen. Uh, then, likewise, after supper, he took the chalice, mixed the wine and water, and he gave thanks. Amen. He blessed it. Amen. Sanctified it. Amen. Again, we believe, confess, and glorify. The believing and confessing is very much tied up. We have to say amen. Uh, the, he tasted and gave it to us, all disciples and pure apostles, saying that then the priest moves his hands. Take and drink of it, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for you and for many. This is the sixth covenant and the last covenant in the Bible, and that's <clears throat> the heart of the anaphora. We, we are living the covenant that Christ had made. Spadicon is the uh, masterpiece. It's that center cross in the Urbana, the bread. The, the, actually, this is the portion of the bishop. What do we receive? I think the receiving is a little bit here and not, not very highlighted. We remember, we remember a lot, and we give, we respond a lot. But do we receive? Um, I think what we receive is the presence of Christ with us at the end of this. But it comes in the anamnesis. Mainly that's what we receive, in the anamnesis and epiclesis. So what happens in the anamnesis? In Corinthians also continues, St. Paul says, as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death till he comes. What does the word proclaim mean? It might mean evangelism. And in the Old Testament, in the book of Genesis, it says when Enosh, the third son of Adam, was born, it be was begun that the name of the Lord was Yudab uh, Esmerab, uh, to be proclaimed. The people start to call on the name of the Lord, to call on. And then you read it in the Hebrew, to call on the name of the Lord has two meanings. Either to preach, to evangelize, or to call God. It's the, the same and uh, meaning. So that might mean the same, that we take the body and blood to have a prayer that involves Christ or to call on the name of Christ outside. So what do we celebrate in this part? Let's read. For every time you eat of this bread and drink of this cup, you preach my death, confess my resurrection, 
and remember me till I come. That's what St. Paul said. We, um, and then people say, Amen, Amen, Amen. Again, we continue with the response of what we offer. Faith, believing, Amen, Amen, Amen. We preach your death, O Lord, your holy resurrection and ascension we acknowledge. We praise you, that's what we offer. We bless you, what we offer. We thank you, O Lord, we offer. We supplicate you, our God. And the priest, as we, now that's the anamnesis, put in a very summarized way. We already had done that, but he's summarizing it. Make sure that we have done this. It means, what it means to, to remember is to take time to bring to mind the events. Like, I'm going to take a time to say uh, and put in my mind the cross of Christ, his resurrection, his ascension, one at a time, and his sitting at the right hand of his Father, and his second coming, all coming together. Uh, ascension to heaven, sitting at the right hand of the Father, and his second coming from heaven, also in glories. We offer you, now what we offer, your oblations from what is yours in every occasion, every condition, and for all things. Where is that from? And, and everything concerning everything and in every, and, 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 uh, in every condition. So in the thanksgiving for prayer. So back to the Eucharistic prayer. Um, deacons, is going to ask us to worship God in awe and reverence. We praise you, we bless you, we serve you, O Lord, and we worship you. At this point, all of us should be in the height of reverence and thanksgiving. That will be the top part in the liturgy where you offer everything in you to God because you have emptied your mind and heart. You have re reminded yourself, you have recalled uh, the actions of God of creation and salvation. And you we're about to receive the first of the two gifts. What is the first of the two gifts? They're the greatest. The first of the two gifts is the gift of the, the Holy Spirit. And the second of the two great gifts? the body and blood of Christ. Now we are harvesting the, the, that part of the liturgy. Uh, the priest prays secretly, and that's what he says. And uh, we call it the epiclesis. And we ask you, our Lord, see, as the people are going, we praise you, we bless you, we serve you, O Lord, and we worship. As are we, we are praising and blessing and serving, the priest is saying, we ask you, our Lord God, we are your sinful and unworthy servants, we need to you by the pleasure of your goodness that your Holy Spirit may descend upon us and upon these offerings placed here to purify them, transform them, and manifest them holy for your, for your saints. Why upon us, upon the bread and wine? Why not just the bread and wine? There is no transformation yet. In the, in the Orthodox way, we don't want to make sharp lines. There is a, there is, it's a process. Exactly. But why is it the prayer is for us and the bread? Because we, from the beginning, from the beginning we said the bread and wine represents us. And we want it to, to be Christ. It's almost like St. Mary. Exactly. We want to be one with him. So we are giving God the Father our stuff. We said the offering is exactly. We're giving ourselves to God and the bread and wine with us. So the main offering, St. Gregory of Nazianza said it. Don't think you're going to offer to God gold or money or, or the most precious gift to God is you. So offer yourself to God. So that the sin of the Holy Spirit is not just on the bread and wine, it is actually on us too. He asks, yes. And all the mysteries, actually, the Orthodox Church is very keen. The priest doesn't take that very extreme authority that the Catholics have given. We don't. Ego absolving, we never say that. Yes. Yes, and you already mentioned in heaven. And in your kingdom. It's beautiful. Actually, it is a very beautiful prayer, and I like to say it loudly. It's not under our control. But he comes on the word of Christ, that Christ made the promise from the Father. Yes. So, uh, to purify them, transform them, and manifest them holy 
for your holies. That means that the Holy Spirit would make bride and bridegroom. People holy, bread and wine holy. And then, and this bread he makes into his holy body, and this wine he makes into his holy, the precious blood. And then eventually, and it is for the mission of sins. Mm -hmm. The words are everything but transubstantiate. Our Lord God and Savior Jesus Christ is given for two things again, remission of sins and eternal life to those who partake of an answer to the sin and death. And this chalice too, he makes into his honored blood. And then our Lord God and Savior and the response, Lord have mercy, Lord have mercy. We'll go back to the, now we start the litanies again. We're down from heaven, but down from heaven with the, the Holy Spirit and the body and blood of Christ. Now we're going. Exactly. We're, 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 yes, yes. We have gone to heaven. We offer God our praise with the angels, and we're down to look for what else the church has to do before we offer to God the last prayer, the prayer of our Father. That is the final one. That's the top of the liturgy. We have, but we're going to say this next time. We have to collect everything. We have to bring heaven and earth, the dead and the life, all together into one place where we offer our Father. The Father, everything. We give him everything with the body of Christ. Because that St. Paul says, in him he gathers everything. That in Christ, the Father had gathered everything in heaven and on earth. And we have to do this in the liturgy. We'll, next time we'll see how we do this in the litanies and the commemoration of the saints. Some people ask, why do we pray for the, old, the dead people? I don't think the church takes it from the point of intercession on behalf of the dead as much more of the point of unity, that in Christ all is united. There is no separation. He went to hell. He went to heaven. He went and preached to the people that were waiting for the, the Messiah. And he made them all one. And that unity has to be played out. It has to be presented in the liturgy. Any question? This one. So uh, what, what do we receive in this one? The Holy Spirit is the main one. Right, exactly. And what do we offer? Ourselves again, mm -hmm. continuously, with the bread and wine in unity, in unity. Let's pray. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, one God, I mean, make us worthy, O Lord, to say, thank thee, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. In Christ Jesus, our Lord, thine is the kingdom, power, and glory, now and forever. May the love of God the Father, and grace of his only begotten Son, Jesus Christ, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you. Leave in peace, peace be with you.